recording this so I can share the screen now. And there we go. So, so today, what I'm going to be talking about is the art and craft of Hubbard's Roycroft. Um, really, I want to focus in on the books. And I love the idea that Kateri had talked about uh, last week with the talking about her, the threads and the interconnectedness that um, she had with her encounter with John Ruskin. So I want to talk about some of the threads and interconnectedness that brought Albert Hubbard to the place of creating these books and creating the Roy Croft Press. And just a little bit about myself. So my background is actually in art and art education. I've lived in Western New York my whole life and I love Western New York history. Interesting enough, I didn't really know anything about the Roycroft. Uh, I came to the Roycroft by way of PBS. I worked for PBS for about six years and one of the last projects I had worked on at the uh, station was a documentary on Albert Hubbard and the Roycrofters. And if anybody's interested in that program, just Google Albert Hubbard and PBS and you should be able to find it either as a whole program or in parts. Uh, from that project, I, I began working at the Roycroft about some, almost 11 years ago now. And one of the projects that I was asked to do when I first came on was uh, to train the docents to do um, the tours of the campus. And at the time, what the, Roy, what the docents had been using was uh, 14 odd pages of information that didn't really have a specific uh, theme or thread going through the story. Um, I found a lot of information that seemed to um, differ amongst itself, uh, such as that the Roycroft, I had two different dates on when, when the Roycroft actually started. Um, 1895 and 1897, which I thought was somewhat unusual that, you know, a two year span, you'd think that they'd be able to pinpoint the exact time that the Roy Croft started. So I'll talk a little bit about that in my piece. But I kind of felt as if those 14 pieces were kind of like the puzzles, the pieces of a puzzle and the puzzle actually had 500 pieces to it. So there were a lot of, of years that were completely missing out of Albert Hubbard's life. Um, like I said, there was a lot of, of information that seemed to be uh, contradicting each other. Um, there were some, um, shall I say that Albert Hubbard might be the first person who used alternative facts when he, uh, when he talked about his own history. Um, so let me just go through a little bit about where these, these threads that I have found um, in studying Albert Hubbard and where they led to the creation of the Roy Croft Press. So for those who don't know, Albert Hubbard was born out in Illinois. Um, he loved the outdoors. He pretty much thought he was going to be a farmer the rest of his life. At the age of 16, and this is a picture from, his, from uh, when he was 16, a cousin of his came to his house and told him of these wonderful adventures of selling soap. So he joined his cousin and later on his brother-in-law and started selling soap door to door as a soap slinger. He quickly moved up through the ranks and became a very, very successful um, marketer and seller of soap. Um, that soap company that he had with his cousin and brother-in-law would eventually break up. He would follow his brother-in-law to Buffalo and his brother-in-law John Larkin would form the Larkin Soap Company. Now he worked for that soap company for almost 20 years. 
Um, and this is an important piece of the puzzle as far as uh, the success of the Roy Croft. Many of these arts and crafts communities that were around the world um, didn't last as long as the Roy Croft, partially because um, they were very idealistic in their ideas for the community. Um, with Albert Hubbard having that business background, I think he was able to sustain uh, the the, the shops much longer than many of these other organizations uh, tried to do. He lived in Buffalo with his wife Bertha for a short time, but he'd eventually move out to East Aurora, um, mainly because East Aurora was a horse town, it still is, um, and he liked the uh, rural lifestyle that he had missed from uh, living in Illinois. He could still raise horses, but easily hop on the train and take him into Buffalo to continue to work for the soap company. While in East Aurora, and this is, this is one of my absolutely favorite pictures of Albert Hubbard sitting here uh, reading a book with pencil in hand. Um, one of the important things about Albert when he was a soap slinger for Larkin is the idea that, uh, especially in the 19th century, the idea of a traveling salesman had some stereotypical connotations to it. The idea of you know, having a girl in every town. Um, when, when you weren't selling uh, your products, you were probably out at a bar drinking or smoking or playing uh, pool or gambling. Albert was not like that at all. Whenever he wasn't selling, he was studying, he was reading, he was going to museums, he was going to lectures, he was going to libraries. Uh, and this is where he first finds John Ruskin. Um, he also read Whitman, uh, Thoreau, Emerson, the, the, the transcendentalists. This is where he first gets these ideas on, on how to live a different life from what was happening in society at the time. He buys uh, this house along with his wife on South Grove Street. This is where the rooms of the inn currently are. No longer exists, but you know, it was a pretty large Victorian house at the time. And with his wife, they were very interested in education. And there were quite a few East Aurora intellectual groups that they ended up joining. Um, the first one was the Chautauqua Literary and Scientific Circle. Um, so they were both interested in, in learning more, especially uh, when it came to literature. And the other organization that Albert joined was the Junto Group. Now, I don't know if anybody knows of Junto or Junto, uh, but it was actually uh, a group that Benjamin Franklin first began in 1727 for the purpose of um, debating about societal uh, morals, politics, natural philosophy, uh, uh, exchange of business ideas. Um, and it was pretty much an informal um, men's club, if you will. Now, Albert joins that group along with a variety of other important figures of the community. Dr. Arthur Mitchell was a doctor and next door neighbor to Albert. Uh, Reverend Salis was a universalist minister. William McIntosh was the editor of the Buffalo Evening News at the time. Eugene White was a poet. And Harry P. Tabor was a pith, uh, printing and lithography salesman for Cossack and Company. Now, Cossack and Company was the advertising organization that worked with the Larkin Soap Company. Since Albert was kind of the advertising person for the Larkin Soap Company, it's very likely that they worked closely together at Larkin and became friends. We do have some, uh, some ideas of some of the things they talked about at these meetings. Um, Tabor at one meeting gave a brief history of printing, including examples of topography from the early Venetian printers. Albert uh, had a talk on uh, doing a revival of pamphleteering, 
with talks about Milton, Swift, Defoe, King James, and uh, Thomas Paine. So already you're starting to see these ideas of, of literature, of books, of, of the art of those books. And many of the, these ideas that were discussed in these meetings are going to have a lasting impact on many of these figures here. Um, the Junto group only lasted a couple of years. Um, Harry Tabor ended up having some health issues and through, um, through doctor's suggestions, decided to move to Denver, Colorado um, to hopefully that the, the, the weather would help his, his illnesses. Hubbard himself was starting to head off in a different direction as well, which we will soon uh, look at. Another important figure to this interconnectedness is this woman, Alice Moore. Alice Moore was a friend to Albert and Bertha. Um, she was a single teacher. She ends up moving in with them um, since single teachers at the time were not allowed to uh, live by themselves. Um, she was very well read. She had a multiple master's degrees. Um, I should point out that Albert's wife also had a master's degree. Albert seemed to surround himself with very, very intelligent uh, women. And Alice was very well read in the literature of the times as well. So Alice and Albert would stay up late into the evenings having these philosophical uh, conversations about the writings and the philosophy of it um, and uh, would encourage Albert to pursue his career in writing. The next person that becomes a thread to this whole picture is Herbert Stuart Stone. Now this is not a picture of Herbert Stuart Stone. This is actually his father, um, Melville Stone. Uh, Melville Stone it was the person who founded the Chicago Daily News um, and was very influential on his son's upbringing. He surrounded his son with uh, many uh, notable writers of the time. And this is a picture of Herbert Stone uh, who eventually would head off to Harvard to pursue a career in uh, writing and publishing. Now, uh, Stone ended up uh, starting up his own publishing firm with a fellow classmate, a uh, man by the name of Ingalls Stone, and they produced the publishing firm of Stone and Kimball. And in 1894, I should even say May of 1894, Stone comes up and starts publishing a small little pocket-sized magazine called The Chapbook. And The Chapbook was a way, uh, it was almost like a catalog of the books that they were publishing through their publishing firm. Now where we think we got the, the where he got his title from The Chapbook was actually um, the 16th century, there were English peddlers that walked around Europe and they were called Chapmen. And they would have these little books in their bags and go around and sell them to the communities around Europe. And we think he kind of took off on that and started making this little chat book. Um, it was rather slim and small, only 32 pages. It was small, four and a half inches by six inches easily available to put in the pocket of your coat. And it quickly became a leading literary magazine and would have hundreds and hundreds of imitators. Now this book was first published in mid-May of 1894. And almost to the day, Albert Hubbard leaves the soap company and decides he is going to head off and learn how to be a writer himself. So um, he ends up in Harvard as well and meets Herbert Stone, so they have a connection. Albert ends up leaving college after only a semester and decides he's going to do somewhat of a grand tour of England. So around the same day that the chapbook is being published for the first time, 
Albert takes a trip to England with his next door neighbor, Arthur Mitchell, the doctor, and they start doing a grand tour of England and Scotland. Now, while in England, he does visit the Kelmscott Press. Now, a question arose earlier if he ever, um, about meeting John Ruskin and meeting William Morris. Now, according to Albert Hubbard, he did meet both of them. Now, the only evidence I have seen of that is the fact that Albert Hubbard said he did. Um, at the time, by mid-1894, er, both Morris and Ruskin would have had um, some major health issues. And just having, you know, Albert Hubbard at the time would have been somewhat of a nobody, um, a, a, a businessman coming from the States. Um, I, I find it somewhat uh, difficult to believe that he actually met either of these men and, and spoke to them. It's, it's still very possible that he did. I just haven't found any evidence of it. But he did go to the Kelm Scott Press. I do believe that. And he was in, uh, you know, overwhelmingly inspired by what Morris was doing, especially the idea of the private press movement that Morris was a big um, founder in. And this is the idea of creating printing presses that were operating more from an artistic or a crafts-based endeavor than from some type of commercial venture. Albert sees this and says, you know, nobody's doing anything like this back in America. I'm going to head back to America and, and you know, start up a private press of my own. So now we have the philosophy that he learned from his readings of Ruskin. We have um, the ideas that he learned from that Junto group as far as uh, medieval books. Um, we have the inspiration that he finds from William Morris at the Kelmscott Press. And then somewhat out of the blue, Harry Tabor, who was his friend from the Junto group who went off to Denver, um, decides to uh, emerge once again in East Aurora. Now, just to give you a little bit, bit background about Harry Tabor. So when he went off to Denver, he began, began working for a Denver newspaper as a reporter. And along with the editor of that newspaper, uh, Luther Bickford, these two men came up with the idea of a new magazine called The Philistine. So the idea for the Philistine magazine was actually started by Tabor himself. Tabor's gonna move back to East Aurora and within six months of his return, Tabor's going to be associated with two men, uh, Newell White and Harry Wagner, who were publishing a weekly newspaper in East Aurora called The Citizen. He begins working for that newspaper space becomes available in the back of the building where this, uh, where the uh, Pendennis printing shop is. And Tabor sets up his own small little printing press along with some type. And he kind of sets up his own private little business as a printer doing these side jobs. One of the first side jobs that Tabor picks up is to uh, put into type uh, some stories that Albert Hubbard wrote while he was in England, which was his little journeys, these ideas of uh, visiting somebody's house and having dinner with them and what they would talk about. Um, Rick had talked about uh, Albert Hubbard's little journey to John Ruskin's house. Um, he would have write uh, another one to William Shakespeare's house. And Tabor would set these stories in type and print up a, double, uh, a dozen or so copies of these stories and only changing the name of the publisher that is written on the cover of it. Because Albert was going to go off to New York City and to Chicago and try to find a publisher to get his little journeys printed. 
even to the point of Albert Hubbard writing in his first full volume of his little journeys and giving full credit to Tabor. On the title page, he wrote to H.P. Tabor, on whose head be the blame for the existence of this book, having first suggested it and with his own hands set the first journey in type. Tabor also starts setting into type the first issue of the Philistine magazine by hand. Printed up 2,500 copies on his Chandler and Price Gordon job press. Volume one of the Phil Philistine rolled out in June of 1895 in appearance with the first issue very much resembling what the chapbook looked like. It was the exact same size, four and a half by six inches, same number of pages, 32 pages, even had the, the same cream color on the first couple issues. Eventually they will put uh, a brown butcher paper on the cover instead. And as, uh, as Rick had mentioned, um, the comment of this was the idea that their, their magazine had meat in it compared to what the uh, chapbook was actually talking about. Now this little uh, printing company that Tabor started in the back room, he eventually will call the Roy Croft Press. So when I mentioned earlier about these two different dates that I have found, 1895 and 1897. So 1895 is the date on which Harry Tabor started the Roy Croft Press. 1897 we'll get to in just a short time. So as far as this first issue, Albert Hubbard really didn't do too much in it. Um, Tabor is the one who said it and was the editor. William McIntosh, who we had mentioned earlier from that Junto group, uh, wrote the keynote in the leading article. And the only thing Albert Hubbard really um, contributed to this issue was an ex excerpt from his William Morris Little Journeys. And that was really all. It was by the fourth issue in September that they started using that butcher brown paper that pretty much stays with the Philistine until its end. The printing business continued to grow. Um, in September of 1895, the Penn Dennis Press ends up moving into the western portal of the building um, next door to a barber shop right here on Main Street. You can see my cursor. And the printing shop continued to grow as far as the creation of the Philistines and some of Albert Hubbard's other little books like The Little Journeys. So when you talk about the Roy Kroc Press, I can look about it in four different periods. The first one being the experimental period. And what I mean by that is the whole idea of that this group of men uh, really didn't have an understanding or an expert expertise in creating books. Um, Albert was thinking of things as more of a writer um, Tabor was thinking of things more as setting type, um, but they didn't really have a, a big understanding of the actual creation of books. So these first three uh, years were really experimental in many ways. Um, the, the Roy Crofters, and I use that in, in Hoover quotes, started really working on their first two books in 1895 in between issues of the magazine. Um, Tabor was setting the type for that first book called The Song of Songs by Hand with his younger brother Horace helping him print it on their Washington hand press. Uh, uh, Hubbard wrote an introduction to it. And they came up with the idea that um, to make the book a little special, that they were going to have uh, some of the books decorated by hand to, to sell. Now, uh, this picture, the woman on the right is Bertha Hubbard. This is Albert Hubbard's first wife. 
Uh, the woman on the left is, uh, her name is Alta Fatty, who ends up becoming uh, Bertha's daughter-in-law. She'll end up marrying their, their oldest son. But um, they asked Bertha if she would be willing to decorate some of the books. She ended up uh, hand illuminating 12 of the copies of the Song of Songs. Now, Bertha was an extremely good, or was, was talented painter when it came to China painting. And I just wanted to show this quick vase that we do have in our museum. This is one of her vases that Bertha painted, which is absolutely lovely. And I wanted to show this prior to showing you the first couple pages of the Song of Songs that Bertha had painted. Now the Song of Songs is pretty scarce. There were only about 300 copies printed of which most of them were just given away, not even sold. But this is the title pages that Bertha hand painted for the first two Roy Croft books. And from looking at these, you know, they are rather crude. Um, but, you know, being an artist myself, I know that there is a very, very big difference between painting and doing topography. And if you are not really uh, educated in doing topography, it can be pretty difficult. So, you know, saying that this is crude, I also think that this is, you know, a, a wonderful first attempt by Bertha who by no means was trained in doing hand lettering and graphic design. But I, I wanted to point these out just because as we get further into the talk to see where the Roy Crofters start heading in their, um, in their skill level of their books. Now Tabor had been putting quite a lot of money into this printing business. Um, he started having some, some financial issues when it came to uh, keeping the business going. And he approached uh, Albert to help him out with some of his uh, outstanding bills. Now, Albert had quite a, a nice next nest egg that he had gotten after being with the Larkin Soap Company. He ends up uh, paying off all of Tabor's bills um, and he purchases the Roy Croft Press, the name, the mark, the Philistine, all from Tabor with the idea that they would continue to stay in business together and split any revenue and profits that they made 50-50 between the two men. This agreement uh, only lasted a short time. Um, there was a heated disagreement between the two men over some of the articles that they were publishing in the magazine. I have still not found which particular items these were, but, uh, but Albert Hubbard pretty much told Tabor that if he didn't like it, um, he no longer had any um, say in the matter since Albert owned the print shop all to himself. And so Tabor ended up leaving in February of 1896 and Albert had the Roy Croft Press all to himself. There is no record that we have of Tabor and Hubbard ever talking again, which is somewhat sad since it seemed like they did have quite a long friendship up to that point. Now Hubbard had somewhat lofty ideas of trying to recreate the Kelmscott Press that he had seen in England. He wanted to try to emulate the craftsmanship and the graphic style of the Kelmscott Press. Again, his knowledge of how to do that was very, very limited. Um, his basic understanding of books uh, only included a brief employment with the Arena Publishing Company in Boston. Um, he had helped, helped write and prepare many of the ads for the Larkin Soap Company, and he did have a strong interest with basic understanding of book making and topography, page makeout, um, the reading of galley proofs, 
how ink was applied to paper, but there was very little understanding of the more technical aspects of the book. By midsummer of 1897, White and Wagner, who owned the Pendennis Press, also became uh, having financial issues and offered to sell their entire printing company to Hubbard for $1,000. So now not only did he have the printing press from Tabor, but now he had the full printing company, if you will, that no longer would exist. Along with buying this, uh, the Pandennis Press, along with that also came Cy Rosen, who joined as an apprentice printer. He later would become a master topographer and pressman for the Roycroft and became the first superintendent of the Roycroft shop and served as vice president of the corporation during the 1930s. So not only did Hubbard acquire more equipment, but he started acquiring some, some help in the production of these books. So in 1897, Albert decides to build his first Roycroft shop, which was located directly next door to his house. So this is where we have the date 1897. So the start of the Roycroft Press in its first actual official Roycroft building was in 1897, which is where we have that, you know, that, that mix up of, if you will, of those two dates of 1895 and 1897. These first three years uh, were filled with um, trial and error, error in many ways, learning about paper, um, handmade, handmade paper, which is what they really wanted to use, was very inconsistent in texture and thickness. And because of that, ink worked differently with it. So which papers worked best with the ink? And then the, also the idea, since they wanted to continue to hand illuminate these pages, um, paper that might work well with ink might not necessarily work well with paint. So it was a lot of trial and error as far as figuring out what would work back best with the types of books that they wanted to create. And along with that, artists started to arrive on the campus. And a couple major artists that I wanted to talk about is Lewis Kinder. Um, I, unfortunately, I have not been able to find a photo of Kinder yet, but hopefully in my, in my studies I will. Uh, Kinder had studied in Leipzig, Germany, which was uh, Europe's kind of famous bookbinder center. Um, and near the end of 1896, he's going to arrive in East Aurora and help establish the Roycroft bindery. He's going to end up teaching this art of bookbinding to many of the local um, young men and women who start showing up on the campus to, for work. Another artist, W.W. W. Denslow, was an illustrator and will illustrate many of the early editions of the Philistine. Um, Denslow is most famous for being the illustrator for the first edition of The Wizard of Oz, but he is a very important figure in the early rise of the Roycroft Press. And the third figure that I'll talk about is Dard Hunter. Um, Dard Hunter is uh, somewhat of a Renaissance man in the sense of it seemed like whatever, whatever material uh, or medium he worked in, he seemed to be able to just master it in no time at all. Um, and he will be a, a very important figure in creating the Roycroft look. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But all of these men, besides for adding their own talents to, um, to the Roycroft, they also were training the, the um, fellow employees, the young men and women who were coming in from the farms who wanted to find a new job in a different way. In the summer of 1898, a simple but significant three-word sentence is going to appear in that issue, the June issue of the Philistine, and it simply read, chapbook dead. So the chapbook, which is kind of where they got the idea for the Philistine magazine, had created almost 200 
uh, imitators and contemporaries. And by the summer of 1898, only three of those types of magazines would survive. Uh, Thomas Bird Mosner's Bibelette and Hubbard's own Philistine and Little Journey. So Hubbard kind of, um, kind of reveled in the idea that his magazine was still going and his fellow classmates, uh, Stone's Chapbook had kind of ended up going away. By the end of 1898, they had printed 15 books, twice as many as the previous two years. This trial and error period were evolving into a more relaxed and orderly mode of operation at the Roycroft Press. And it's a good thing that things were starting to uh, run more efficiently because for those who don't know, by the end of 1898, they are going to have a major um, boom in the, uh, in the industry itself. So the second phase I want to talk about is the mature period. So this is 1899 to 1907. Um, this period is really where you will find many of the Roy Crofter's finest books being produced. Um, and part of this is because of the artists that are working here, but also because of the boom in the, in the uh, organization. And that is the March 1899 issue of the Philistine produces a small little story called A Message to Garcia which as Rick was talking about earlier, um, as we would say today, it went viral. Um, it becomes the third largest selling book at the time behind only the Bible and the dictionary. It ends up being translated into 37 languages. It's made into two different movies, one silent and one talkie. And it pretty much creates um, notoriety for Albert Hubbard overnight. Besides for increasing the income coming in, other benefits, uh, for the notoriety of Hubbard is that he becomes a hot ticket on the lecture circuit. So he starts traveling around the country speaking and he never would miss an opportunity to sell his Roy Croft shop. So it becomes a boom. He starts to expand the print shop. The initial print shop room was this building right here, which as Rick was talking is now the lounge of the inn, and then he builds the tower behind it. The tower is very symbolic in many ways. Rick was mentioning the Ruskin room, but very symbolically, the upper floor is the Ruskin room. Right below the Ruskin room is what's known as the Morris room. Below the Morris room was where Albert Hubbard had his own private library which he opened up to all of his guests and his workers. And then in the basement underneath the library was where the printing presses were. So very symbolically, you have this flow from the ideas of Ruskin being manifested in the work of Morris, being found in the books that Albert read and studied to be then reproduced by Hubbard himself in the printing shop down below. He expanded the print shop once again to the south, adding a whole nother wing. And this just gives you some ideas of the Roy Croft Press continuing expanding. This is what, uh, again, for those who have been at the Roy Croft Inn, this is what is now Hubbard Hall. And finally, he just decided that he needed to build a second print shop. So in October of 1899, he starts building this print shop. And again, this wonderful picture of the stones that the farmers had dropped off on the campus and literally building the buildings by hand. The second print shop would be the largest building on the campus, 24,000 square feet. Each floor had its own a function to it with 37 printing presses being in the lower level of this building. Circulation of the Philistine had nearly doubled by the end of the year, surpassing 90,000 copies. Little Journeys, um, which the Roycrofters were now 
publishing themselves had reached over, um, I'm sorry, uh, the, the Philistine was at 90,000 copies, the Little Journeys was at 30,000 copies. They had increased to uh, creating 19 of their own books by 1899. And the illuminators were now being asked and encouraged to put their own full names into their work. Into the title pages, they began listing the, uh, the artists who designed the ornamentation of the books, the pressmen, the binders, all incentives for the individuals to excel and do great work. And I think this is really important when I think back on uh, Jim's talk, that very first talk when, he, when we were looking at the cathedrals of the medieval times and how you had these workers you know, creating their own sculptures on the facades of these churches. The same thing is kind of happening at the Roycroft as far as their books. These women, uh, the illuminators, the pressmen, were all kind of given their own um, freedom on what they were creating as far as their paintings and their designs. And here's one of the title pages from the Little Journeys book that was hand illumined. And if you, again, if you look back or think about um, those first pages that Bertha had created that were somewhat you know, rudimentary, you now have these artists creating these very beautifully um, hand-painted title pages. Now, looking at these, you can see that you know, they're, they're pretty much copying what Morris was doing at the Kelm Scott Press which you know, is fine, but they haven't really um, discovered you know, their own uh, individual identity yet. But some of these title pages are you know, absolutely beautiful and you can see that the different designs really you know, highlight um, the individuality that these artists had in creating these pages. This mature period is really the years where Hubbard's designers, topographers, and book binders did the bulk of their best work. W.W. Um, w. Denslow will eventually conclude his short Roy Croft career in 1900. Um, art director Samuel Warner would reach his artistic peak. Louis Kinder is going to create his most exquisite bindery work. But this truly is a working arts and crafts community by this time. And these many different scenes of the typesetting floor of the second print shop. As well as these printing presses becoming much more technologically advanced. I also just love these images of the fact that both men and women were working together on these projects side by side in many cases. Now I want to talk quickly about Dard Hunter. So Dard Hunter's influence on the Roycrofts cannot be uh, understated. Um, he created these wonderfully masterful graphic and book designs from 1905 to 1907 and really kind of creates this Roycroft identity. So this is an example of uh, the title page from the Roycroft book catalog from I believe this is this is 1902. And now I want to show you that same title page from 1905 as designed by Dart Hunter. <clears throat> very, very different. You can see that the one uh, on the left really has that William Morris-like um, idea to it, where Dart Hunter is picking up ideas for the, from the Viennese secessionists, um, 
Art Nouveau, becoming much more stylized, um, working with a more flowing um, uh, topography. And it really brings a whole new look to what the Roy Croft aesthetic is. And again, if you look at what is, you know, a somewhat simple design for the Philistine cover. And this is one of Dart Hunter's first designs. Now this wasn't for the Roy Croft. This was actually for a brochure for his brother who was a magician and traveling around on the lecture circuit. But you can see some very interesting um, designs that will, will eventually end up in Roy Croft designs. Um, his use of leaf and tulip embellishments, um, the borders accented with stylized stems and red buds that frame the title. Um, these are all going to be um, elements that he's going to bring into um, the Roy Croft. So this is some of the back covers that Hunter designs for the Philistine, which is very different from what the front cover will look like. But he starts using these wonderful stylized borders with appearance of what is known as the Hunter Rose, the square stylized rose image that was, will be found around the campus from then on. Or even something like this, this was, uh, uh, book design for uh, Justinian the Theodora that Alice and Albert wrote together. Um, he designs not only the cover, but the title pages, um, the ornamentation, the uh, initial letters. Um, and, and it's, it's just this wonderful stylized uh, incorporation of uh, Narcissus with black stalks below the title, reading appearing uh, above the title in these bursts of orange blossoms. Um, the border and uh, colophon that he repeats throughout um, the book. It, it's just an absolutely beautiful design and, and different from anything else that, that the Roy Crofters had been working on. Another design by Hunter or uh, Rick, Rick Van Winkle from 1905. This was Hunter's second book design. Again, these stylized illustrations, um, these beautifully line drawings of landscape that he'll continue throughout with his um, initial letters throughout and even the design of the leather of the cover, absolutely beautiful. A redesign of the Little Journeys covers. Again, it's interesting how he can completely go from a, uh, a flowing curvilinear design similar to maybe what Morris was doing to this very geometric design that he's learning from the Viennese secessionists. These two designs, both the, the exact mo uh, same motif, this uh, ivy, le ivy leaves and berries. And again, you see it here on the left where it's just a simple uh, black line with the red berries. And then over to the right, which is a little bit more color, but more stylized with these just um, the figures closed off in squares and rectangles. Besides for the graphic designs, um, the leather tooling that Lewis Kinder brings to the campus is absolutely wonderful as well. And again, these I just wanted to go through a variety of different um, books just to give you an idea of the beauty and the, um, the difference that each of these books really have to them. And I don't have dates on these, but this is from uh, Lodging for the Night. This is by Kinder. This is a design by Dard, Hunt, by Dard Hunter, but the leather was by Lorenzo Schwartz.
uh, Rip, Rip Van Winkle by Dart Hunter. It's the Last Rites by Kinder. And all of these so different in design, yet all so beautiful. This motif of these circular roses, more like Macintosh. It's by uh, Harry Avery. And Life Lessons is by Frederick Kranz. Just a series of all these different designs, absolutely beautiful. And I, I can't imagine uh, there, there was a, a Roy Croft club in which people could sign up for and automatically would, would receive the next book that was published. And I can't imagine you know, what the joy would be like to receive one of these books in the mail and just have this wonderful design being seen. I love this book. This was the book Friendship that was even put into a leather pouch by Frederick Kranz. Some gold gilding in there as well. Hubbard's writings. And these would easily be, you could even commission them. Um, this was by uh, Lorenz Schwartz, but this was specifically commissioned uh, for a Mrs. William Fox who was the wife of William Fox, founder of 20th Century Fox. But, but, you know, having the designs where you literally have it commissioned for you. And then you have something like this, which is absolutely stunning. Uh, contemplation, now this is from a later period from 1920, but this was a box for a book which was hand carved. And I absolutely love this version of the Roycroft orb. And then here is the book that was found inside, also carved from wood. This is the back of that same book. But then another book, another book that was hand carved. And this was for, uh, for a Thomas Lawrence. And you can see his initials are literally carved right into the cover of the book. And then this is the book that was inside it. And then the title page specifically hand done for Thomas Lawson. I mean, that in many, of, many cases, these books are one of a kind. And to see these, these books all stacked together on your bookshelf, I mean, it, it literally was like, works of art sitting there on your shelf. Now from the mature period, you are going to have a slow decline away from handcrafted and elaborately illuminated books. Um, this is partially due to the designs that Dart Hunter is creating. His multicolored graphics were cleverly designed to simulate the appearance of hand illuminated art without imposing too much on the pressmen. His later graphics would fully exploit the technical skills and the machinery of the shop of the, of the Roycroft Press. So by the end of 1907, you have quite a lot of changes happening at the Roycroft, uh, both personally and professionally. Um, Hubbard would have gone through a very public divorce and his new wife, Alice, is going to take full reins of the business. Dard Hunter is going to be spending his last years at the, uh, at the Roycroft. Um, Charles Rosen is going to be promoted to the manager of print, uh, printing, and he is going to start soliciting more commercial printing projects away from these personalized hand designed books. And there was also the, um, the formation of a new magazine called The Fra. 
The Fra was a much larger magazine, nine inches by 14 inches, mainly to be able to um, take on uh, many of the businesses that were already developing ads for other magazines of a larger size. Hand illumination is pretty much all going to vanish altogether, mainly due to it being time consuming and costly. Hubbard is going to start diversifying, uh, diversifying his business um, that is going to distract from the clear focus of printing. Um, they start getting into furniture design, which Rick had mentioned earlier. Uh, they had one chair produced in 1899. By 1908, they now have a catalog, a 48 page catalog showing all of their furniture. They all start getting into more uh, leather goods and copper goods. And this really starts taking away from that main focus of printing that they had earlier. They start yeah, getting larger printing equipment. Um, these two color press, uh, almost the size of a truck. Um, it starts becoming more automated and semi-automated machinery. So they're starting to get more and more away from um, this handcrafted design. They start getting folding machines, trimming machines. And it also starts becoming apparent that it is more cost effective to print a book written by someone else or to reprint your own books than to for Hubbard to continue to write his own books himself, which could take months to do. And some of these presses were the same presses that the New York Times at the time would have been using. So this is, this is some high technology that the Roy Crofters would have gotten into. And to uh, compare the mature period to the expansion period, um, it's only the difference of about one year. So they both last approximately nine years. But where the mature period saw over 60 new titles made, the expansion period saw only 17 new titles made. So they were getting into more of a business of a print shop for others than in their own creation. And the expansion period is really going to end in 1915 with the death of Albert Hubbard aboard the Lusitania. Now, um, one interesting little element that I discovered about uh, Albert Hubbard's demise on the Lusitania is that another of the passengers on board the ship was Herbert Stuart Stone, the man who was his classmate and had started the, the chapbook that kind of sent off this idea of these small publishing magazines. So the Philistine and the chapbook kind of took their last little journey together with both of these men um, having their demise aboard the sinking of the ship. And finally, the post Hubbard era, that would really be the post Albert Hubbard era. So his son, Bert, ends up taking over the shop and even though they still do make some of these uh, personal books for some that, that carved wooden box that we had seen earlier, that contemplation was done during this period, most of what they were doing were really either reprints of Albert Hubbard's former work or going on to diversify to printing other people's work. Um, the Great Depression is really going to have a major effect on the organization as it does on many. I also thought I would do just a quick little look into if the Spanish flu uh, had any impact on the Roy Croft and uh, it did have quite a bit of effect on the printing. So in 1917, there were 24 published books made at that time. 
in 1918 when the flu hits. They only did seven published books, four, four of which were reprints of older titles, including Hubbard's Message to Garcia and Alice's American Bible. The flu is going to continue in 1919. Again, they only published six books, three of which were new editions. The other three were military printings. And then uh, with the recovery from the flu in 1920, the Roycrofters are now publishing 14 books again. So needless to say, the pandemic really had an effect on the Roycroft back 100 years ago as well. Um, in 1938 is really going to be the end of Roy Croft Publishing altogether. Um, Bert Hubbard is going to sell the printing shop to a Samuel Gard, um, who was running a printing shop as well, buys the, buys the shop and tries to run it. But within a few years, the Gard company could not last any longer. And in 1941, the campus goes through bankruptcy. And I'll just end here on this last. This was writing by Bert in 1942. Just now for perhaps another month or two, I'm doing a job I never expected I would have to do, namely acting as trustee under the court in the liquidation of Roycroft. The guard company which bought the plant in 1939 made a miserable failure of its operation and are thoroughly bankrupt. The court had ordered that everything be sold for the benefit of creditors, when that job is done, Roycroft as an institution will have gone into oblivion. It did go into oblivion, but not completely. I'm happy to say that you know, we continue to work on continuing the idea of Roycroft. And we will learn next week more about how the Roycroft Press is coming back with some of the original printing presses and we hope to have a fully functioning 19th century printing press working on the campus again within the next year or two. And I hope you enjoyed my quick walk down the lane of at least the Roycroft Press as far as their books and the threads that interconnected Albert Hubbard into creating the Roycroft Press. Don't know if anybody has any quick questions. <coughs> I'll try to see. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, any thoughts, Alan, as to where the Roycroft or the Art Nouveau influence on lettering and images were coming from? We noticed the in influence of Charles McIntosh in some of the designs, and maybe uh, that just some. Uh, Scottish Spectacles. Okay, so um, a few of the Roycrofters at the time that Dard Hunter arrives, including Kinder, um, had subscriptions to the European uh, magazines at the time that were bringing these ideas of Art Nouveau and Art Deco to the scene. Um, Dard Hunter is eventually going to have his honeymoon in Vienna and they were supposed to stay there for two weeks. They ended up staying for six months. Um, so needless to say, him and his wife truly enjoyed uh, Vienna and brought back many of these, um, these nouveau and secessionist ideas back to the campus. Um, and, and like I said, it wasn't just Hunter. Some of these other artists on the campus were very interested in the designs that were coming out of Europe. Alan. Um, uh, yes. It's it's Jim. I have a, a, what I believe is a quick question, and then I want to say a little bit more about uh, Hubbard's so-called visit to Ruskin. Yes. In, yes. Okay. So the question is, I don't think I've heard it in the presentations, but I'm sure people are interested. Where did the name, why was the name Roycroft chosen? W what was the impetus for that? Sure. So I'll give you Albert Hubbard's answer, and then I'll give you the truth. Okay. <laughs> that sets up the second thing. <laughs> so Albert Hubbard said the name was actually two words put together or royal craft. Oh. The idea that something is so well made it is fit for royalty. So that is what Albert Hubbard said. The truth was that Albert Hubbard bought the name 
Roy Croft from Harry Tabor. Tabor had already been using it himself and he's really the one who, who came up with the name Roy Croft Press. He had gotten it from a font that he had in his shop that he always just loved the name Roy Croft. And it was named after two um, 16th century brothers, a Samuel and Thomas Roy Croft, who were printers from England. Uh -huh. And that Roy Croft family still exists. About a year or two ago, we had um, family members who were descendants of Samuel and Thomas Roy Croft uh, come to the campus and visit with us. So that is still in existence. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, so a little bit more about uh, Hubbard meeting Ruskin in, at Brantwood. Um, it is a dubious story, some think, as Alan indicated. We don't have any hard, really hard evidence about it. Um, I've studied this because he wrote such a lovely piece about his so-called visit to Ruskin. Um, I think what we can pretty well be assured of is that he did go to Coniston, which is where Brantwood is. He did meet some people there. He did go to the house. What we can't really confirm is whether he got in to talk to Ruskin. Right. Ruskin at that time was very, very quiet. He had been out of circulation for about five years because of his mental troubles, etc. But I will say this one thing about Hubbard's piece, which I thoroughly enjoy. Um, and, that, and Joe Weber, who's coming on next week, has done um, a recreation of, of that in a very nice modern way at, uh, at the Roy Croft Press. But I do want to say that Hubbard's details are stunningly good. I mean, his description of, of the room Ruskin was in and his rep reporting of what Ruskin would have said and the way in which he would have put the words together are stunningly good. So uh, my suspicion is that if he didn't actually get to see Ruskin, he talked to a number of people who knew Ruskin well and, and, and kind of got the whole feeling tone of, of the visit and put it into his little journey. But he could have seen him too. I mean, we don't have evidence that he it's, didn't. It's possible, sure. So just a little bit of fill in there. And, and, he, and he had truly immersed himself in Ruskin's writing yeah. too. So yeah. I mean, I really think he had a strong sense of, of who Ruskin was. Yeah. <clears throat> um, were some of John Ruskin's Guild of St. George guidelines incorporated into some of the Ruff, uh, Roycroft Press's earlier operations? Um, that is a good question. I'm not sure. It's, it's very possible. I don't know. I, again, with, with, with uh, Hubbard had vi having visited Europe, I'm sure he would have been, you know, try to immerse himself as m in as much of what Morris and Ruskin had been doing. So it wouldn't surprise me if, if they had, but I, I've not heard of any specifically. Yeah, but let me let me make just a very quick comment on that. I thought your point about how what the uh, the illustrators of the of the magazines uh, at Roycroft and the books at Roycroft, um, I thought that was excellent. And when you tied it back to um, the the medieval cathedrals and working with your hands, I thought that was a really nice link that you made. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that even if Hubbard didn't really put down any actual principles of the guild. He was actually living the principles of the guild. Right. They were very public at the time. Ruskin had written about all of this in his Forest Clavigera letters and other places. So Hubbard surely knew about handwork and it's, it's actually all over Roycroft, you see. You see evidence of it and the quotes. Uh, two questions uh, regarding uh, the Buffalo Library. Um, did anyone here have a chance to see the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library's recent exhibit on additions from the Roy Croft um, and the Roy Croft Holdings? I, I, of course, have. I don't know if anybody else has seen those. Um, they also have a, a great collection of Kelmscott books. Um, I, I, I don't know offhand if anybody knows how many specific books did the Kelmscott do? Was it 68? <laughs> I should know. I'm the person asking the question, but I don't. And while you were talking, I was double checking because um, I'm a retired professor from UB and UB has almost all the Kelmscott editions. Likewise, some of them in on vellum, et cetera, they have a Chaucer. And I really want to check all this out, but right now things are closed down because of right. the pandemic. 
Right. Yeah. I, I mean, Buffalo has has a great collection of Kelmscott between U, uh, the University of Buffalo and the, the Buffalo Library, it's, and as well as Roy Crop books as well. Um, and my other question there was connected with it, which is just that um, our stuff came to us through Thomas Lockwood, through uh, the lawyer who you know, sort of founded Lockwood Library. Yes. Um, and so I want also to learn more about that and what, you know, the long phase of sort of Gilded Age book collecting because um, I'm a Shakespearean. And so the Shakespeare texts that we have come from Charles Clifton on the one hand and Thomas Lockwood on the other. So I want to kind of know more about, learn more about the relationship between rare book collecting on the one hand and the enthusiasm for fine book production that is um, exemplified by Kelmscott on the one hand and Roycroft on the other. So that's my nexus. Yeah, it's, a, it's very interesting when you think about, you know, the private press and the ideas of this creating books for an art sake instead of commercial sake. It's happening at the, the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. And that also just happens to be kind of, you know, one of the peaks of Buffalo's history at least when it's when it was the wealthiest. So I think with that, Buffalo is is lucky enough to have a, a, a wide collection. Yep. Yeah. This is about um, the tussle that Henry Clay Folger had with Charles Clifton over the first folio that's there. So um, you know, it's a thing. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. And and honestly, well, I, I know we're we're having this this COVID issue and we're zooming all over the place. Um, we have a thought, a thought about possibly uh, getting in touch with the libraries and see if we can possibly do kind of a Zoom visit um, from the libraries in their rare book room and see if we might be able to do that, you know, possibly in the, in the January or February. So, so be on the lookout for that. Maybe you can, we can see some of those books. That uh, would be wonderful. And I actually know those people pretty well. Oh, I great. Can. Great. Well, I, I might have to reach out to you then, Barbara. Thank you. Did Albert Hubbard have an understanding of financial management derived from his soap industry experience? If so, was this applied to the Roy Cross startup operations? Absolutely. Um, I, I think this is one of the main reasons why the Roy Croft was able to sustain, sustain itself as long as it did. Um, and uh, a lot of what Albert um, started at the Larkin Soap Company, really was brought over to Roy Croft. And there is a, a very good book about John Larkin that talks a lot about the soap company. Um, Linda, is, is it simply called John Larkin? You're on mute right now. Yeah, John, I think yes. it's John Larkin, and it, you can still get it if you just go to Amazon Used Books, you can get a copy. And before I do any kind of talk or anything, lots of times I just read through that information. Great, thank you. Well, I, I've gone over a little longer than I had hoped, but I hope everybody enjoyed um, just a, a couple a couple quick commercials. Um, next week is our last I week. I make a comment? Could I make a comment? Oh, sure. This is Joe Weber, and uh, the I, I must say that you know, over the last 15 years, we've been working very hard on doing exactly what you're your, uh, the last person to comment that make, made, uh, and that is that we are trying to do this pro book production the same way it was done back when Albert Hubbard was alive. And we've, we've been fairly successful. And it, it, uh, Kurt Maranto and Alan Nowicki have been, been splendid in the way they supported this book production. And, and, and while Alan gave you this great history, he, he really someone should add what, what they've done to help us uh, bring about this new production and the new shop, which uh, you'll hear about more next week, but uh, I just thought I'd, I'd mention that. Thank yeah, you. I want to say too, as we wind up, um, both of these presentations were terrific. I've learned a, a huge amount and compliments to both you and Rick for a lovely job. I think you have made the case wonderfully for the connection between Ruskin and Morris and the arts and crafts uh, originating in uh, in the UK and brought it over to America. I think you've done a great job with that. So thanks. Thank you.
And just one last commercial then, I know I included it in the last email, but if you are enjoying these talks, um, the conference is ending next week, but uh, the Roy Croft is having their fall history course starting up in November. It will be Saturdays. Uh, initially, we had it set for noon, but we have uh, moved it back an hour just because of some conflicts with some other arts and crafts organizations. Thank you, Alan, for pointing that out. So, um, so our talks will beginning, begin at 11 a.m., just like the conference has been. Uh, and our first week, uh, first Saturday in November will be Jim Spates. So if you enjoyed him at the start of our conference, he will be back talking about Ruskin. And we will be taught, the, the theme of the history course is kind of the masters of the arts and crafts where each week we will be looking at uh, Ruskin, Morris, Stickley, and we will actually be looking, instead of at Albert Hubbard, we'll be looking at Bert Hubbard and how he was able to sustain the Roy Croft after his father had, had left. So if you're interested in some more talks, you can sign up either individually for uh, specific talks or you can sign up for the whole, um, uh, whole history course and I'll send out more information on that um, this coming week with our last email. Uh, yes, uh, Robert Rust is in November as well for those who know Robert Rust. So um, thank you again, I hope you enjoyed and we will see you next week. Anything else from anybody? Rick, thank you. Do you have something to say, Rick? You're in mute. No, oh, no, that was fun. That was fun, I learned a lot from you and uh... Hopefully everybody got a good tour of the campus and I hope to come and see us. Great. Thank you all. We will see you next week.